Morning folks, I'm Dave Canterbury with Self-Reliance Outfitters and the Pathfinder School out here at the Pathfinder Outdoor Classroom. What I thought we'd do is we'd start a series on trapping. And I have about 100 videos already on my YouTube channel under the heading Modern Trapping, which is a playlist that you can go back and look at. However, lots of those videos are pretty old. I've learned a lot of tips and tricks since then. And I wanted to shoot an updated series, basically starting from the beginning. Okay, guys, real quick before we start the series, let me just give you a little bit of understanding about how I learned what I know about trapping. Obviously, I've been trapping for 10 plus years intentionally. I trapped a little bit when I was a kid, just fooling around, but trapping intentionally for about 10 years. I've been to the Fur Takers of America College twice. Uh, I've studied with some of the most expert trappers in the United States. I'm a certified expert trapper by the Protectors of America, and I'm a licensed Ohio nuisance trapper as well. So when it comes to trapping, I'm going to try to pass on to you knowledge that's been passed on to me, as well as knowledge that I've gained and wisdom I've gained through experience trapping on this property over the last 10 years to enlighten you on how I think is the best way to accomplish certain tasks. We do have a trappers, modern trappers course coming up here at the school in two weeks when trapping season opens. We'll be teaching trapping of everything from, you know, water trapping, upland game, the whole gamut of trapping where we're teaching that class over the course of four or five days. However, I thought with a YouTube series, I could kind of slowly go through things with you guys one video at a time and give you a bit of a trapper's education type video that you don't have to pay for necessarily to understand trapping if you're new to the sport or if you're new to the hobby of trapping. And trapping is both a sport and a hobby, really, because it's sporting in the fact that you can harvest game off the landscape and you can consume that game. You can also use pieces and parts of the animal for other things, and we'll talk about that as we go. But it's also something that you can use for a management practice if you own a large piece of property like I do here at the Pathfinder School, and you start to notice declines of certain species, you can target certain species to kind of control that. Now, coyotes are difficult to control, in and of themselves because they travel, because they're a pack animal, because they tend to breed to increase population numbers where populations are less dense. And so coyotes are something that are very hard to control the population of. However, you can, by trapping an area for coyotes and catching several coyotes, you can deter coyotes from coming into that area for a certain amount of time, I believe. There's nothing proven to say that, but it seems to me like once I catch a few coyotes in a year. The next year, I don't see as much sign of coyotes, and I start to see more flourishing of smaller game animals and things like that. There's other animals that you may want to harvest to control populations of ground egg-laying birds, like pheasants, like quail, like turkey. Certain things like raccoons and possums that are egg eaters need to be controlled in those areas as well so that they don't decimate those populations. And I can tell you from personal experience that when I bought this piece of property and moved on to it almost 10 years ago now. I didn't see any turkey whatsoever. I didn't see any quail. And I saw very few ground birds other than a few snipe that actually lay eggs on the ground. However, after I started trapping this area, got rid of a lot of the possums, took a lot of the coons, took a few coyotes and things like that, I started to see the deer population come back and seeing more deer every year. I started to see lots of turkey and quail on this property that I never saw before. So I would say from personal experience that trapping some of these predator, predatory type animals and scavenger type animals that eat certain things that you want to bring back into the population of your property, you can do that by managing and trapping for management. So let's start off today by talking about trapping ethics, okay? And I've got five bullet points here. And of course, I'm big on fives, the five by five survival system. So I try to break things down as simple as I can to five main categories because I think that's easy to remember. So when it comes to trapping ethics, there's five key points I want you to be aware of. The first one is trap articulation, and this really has to do more with upland type sets and foothold type sets. And don't get confused by the terms leg hold and foothold. There's really no leg hold trap unless it was set completely wrong and you have a non-target species in that trap, and we'll talk about that in a minute, and it's clamped around their leg. The trap should clamp around the pad area of their foot below 
the heel pad in between the toe pads. That's where you should be catching these animals. So they're a foothold type trap. Articulation of that trap means that that trap can swivel and maneuver so that when that animal twists and turns, rolls over, things like that in the set, he's not being injured by the trap any more than he is being held. If the trap is rigid and when he moves, the trap doesn't move, then he's going to twist and get breaks and sprains and strains in his body. And you don't want that because it cause, causes unnecessary suffering to that animal. And if you're going to let an animal go that was a non-target species and you break its leg, you might as well just kill it right now because it's probably not going to survive. So articulation of traps is important. Humane kills is also very important. If you set a trap that's made to kill an animal, make sure that that trap is large enough to kill your target species immediately. If you have to dispatch an animal on scene, make sure that you do it in a way that kills the animal almost instantaneously so that there's no suffering. Elimination of non-target catches. It's our responsibility as trappers to set traps discriminately to target certain species of animals that we intend to catch. We shouldn't just be going out here and setting traps and hoping we catch whatever, unless you're talking about a survival scenario where you're actually eating that food every day, day in and day out off the landscape, then you really don't care what you catch. But as a, an ethics trapper, as an ethical trapper in a non-emergency scenario, you should be discriminately trapping so that you understand what size trap and what type of trap, what size snare loop, and all of those type of things that we'll talk about later in the series to catch the intended target animal that you're after. Be aware of domestics. You know, we, a lot of us live in suburban areas. I live 12 miles from, well, 8 to 12 miles from the biggest town and probably 6, 7 miles from a smaller town. So I live in a pretty non-urban area. However, there are houses, you know, within shouting distance, at least, of my house. There are public roads that you do see stray animals on. And so... Being aware of domestic animals is important because sooner or later, if you trap long enough in suburban type areas, you're going to catch domestic animals. Now, there's certain traps you can use to eliminate that possibility. We'll talk about that as we go, depending on what you're trying to trap. But if you're trying to trap canines, you're not going to be able to help but catch a stray dog, most likely, if he's in the area because coyotes are a dog and they act like dogs. And we'll talk more about that when we get into trap sets, trap locations, things like that as well. So being aware of domestic animals and understanding how to not catch those animals or eliminate those type catches if you have lots of them in the area is important as well. The last thing that we need to talk about is the don't over harvest. And don't over harvest means just don't trap an area out until there's absolutely nothing left there. I mean, we've been guilty of that in the past, obviously in frontier America. Look at the case of the beaver. They're a very good example of that and as well as over hunting. But I think that over-trapping an area can do just as much harm as it does good as well because while you're trying to manage a population by trapping in a management stamp, from a management standpoint, you can over-harvest and then you don't have any predation of the animals that have to have that to flourish and to create stronger offspring. So there's a happy medium or a balance there that you should think about when you're harvesting animals. Again, unless this is a survival scenario and you're having to live off only what you can catch. And even then, you know, if you can harvest a larger game animal like deer and things like that during the hunting season and put that meat away, it keeps you from having to trap so much off the landscape of smaller game animals. So over harvesting is also a concern from a trapping ethic standpoint. So if you remember these five things, you'll do yourself a big favor when you start to trap. All right, guys, well, listen, I appreciate you joining me out here for this beginning video in our trapping series. We're going to continue with this over the next several days and weeks. Again, it may end up being, you know, 40 or 50 videos before it's over with, but I think it's important to get this out, especially from a self-reliance standpoint, but also for new trappers and people who are interested in trapping in general. I appreciate your views. I appreciate your support. I thank you for everything you do for our school, for our family, and for our business, for all our sponsors, instructors, affiliates, and friends, and I'll be back with another video as soon as I can, guys. Thanks.